Happy Sabbath, everybody. It's good to see you guys. It's good to be here in the house of the Lord. Why don't we begin with a word of prayer? Gracious Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord. Lord, you are good, and you are worthy to be praised. Father in heaven, you sustain us. You give us everything we need, Lord. Lord, our bread, our water, companionship. Lord, everything is is provided that we need in you, Lord. And today, Heavenly Father, give us a word from you. Speak to us, Lord. Encourage us, Lord. Lift us up and prepare us, not only for the days ahead, but, Lord, prepare us for your everlasting kingdom. Thank you, dear Lord. Come into this place strongly. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, our scripture reading, if you want to turn back there to Psalms, in the book of Psalms, and we'll look again. Chapter 16 and verse 11. Actually, why don't we... um, Yeah, we'll start in verse 11 here. And it says, You will show me... Let's say it together. You will show me the path of life. In your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures forevermore. And so today's message is entitled Fullness in His Presence. Fullness in His Presence. We're facing the definite end of all things, aren't we? It's coming. And we should be able to say, praise God and thank you, Jesus. He's coming to take us home, Sister Paralee, right? And that's what we've been long awaiting for. That's what generations have been waiting for. The return of our Savior. But I have to admit that a lot of times we can look at the time that's coming up to that and say, man, I really don't look forward to this time of trouble that's coming. And it's supposed to be worse than we could imagine. But I want to tell you something. I would like to share something with you. This essential preparation for that end time, it's to be found in Him. It's to be found in Jesus. It's to be found in His presence. And if we find that, if we get under the shelter of the Most High, under the shadow of His wings now, and we learn to trust in Him, and we find that place today, and we find that place tomorrow, and we find that place the next day, then when that time comes, we'll be ready. And that is the most essential preparation. The Spirit of Prophecy says that the essential preparation that we need is a knowledge of God. We need a knowledge of God. A knowledge of God is the foundation of all true education and all true service. It's the only real safeguard against temptation. It's the only real safeguard against temptation. And we're faced in this world with a lot of problems, aren't we? And a lot of people have fallen victim to a lot of temptations, haven't they? But God is so good that if we get to know him, you know, this little book, The Ministry of Healing, is so rich. This is one of my favorite books. And it has a solution. That's a whole other sermon, but God has given us the solution for everything. He's given the the solution for the homeless situation. It's even saying in this book that that men are racking their brains trying to figure this out, but God's given it to us. He said that if every family had land to work and everyone was put to work, he says, and that's, I'm not even going to get into that, but God has given us the solution for everything. And so we have to get to know him. It says, the knowledge of God is the foundation of all true education and all true service. It's the only real safeguard against temptation. 
It is this alone that can make us like God in character. Do we know that we need to be like God in character? Do we know that he's coming back for a people that reflect him and that are like him? Well, you have to get to know him. You have to spend time with him. Amen. You have to spend time in his presence. And yes, country living, this is a, one of our messages. And we should do what God tells us to do. Health ministry, the health message, that's something that God has given us. And we will be blessed in following his, the things he's given to us. By, the, by walking in obedience, by walking in the things he's given us, we're going to get closer to him. But we also have to make sure not to put the cart before the horse, right? Because there are country livers out here that aren't ready for the things that are going to happen in this world. Why? Because the reliance is on themselves. And we can fall into that trap too. And so our reliance, our sustenance, our fullness has to be in his presence. It says, this knowledge is needed by all who are working for the uplifting of their fellow men. Are we disciples? Are we to be working for God? Are you going on your own strength? We need the knowledge of God if we are going to work for the uplifting of our fellow men. Transformation of character, purity of life, efficiency in service, adherence to the correct principles all depend upon a right knowledge of God. This knowledge is the essential preparation both for this life and the life to come. Both for this life and the life to come. I like that children's story today. It is very fitting um, that God will supply all your needs. And he will. He will supply all of our needs. We... Um, we want to be found in him, don't we? So that we can be assured of his promises. We want to be able to claim his promises. And let's look at uh, what the scripture is saying again. You see, it's saying, you will show me the path of life. So he's going to direct us in everything that we need to understand for life in this world and for the life to come. And so it continues by saying, in your presence. Now presence, the word is panim. And it means face, presence, person, in front of, before, form. And that word, it's interesting because that word is plural, but it's used in a singular sense. Panim. In the Hebrew, whenever they have im, it's usually a plural significance. But we're coming before our Father in heaven, aren't we? Our Savior, Jesus. And he gives us the gift of the Holy Spirit. So it says all of heaven's agencies are working on our behalf. And I'll read that in Desire of Ages. It's a beautiful quote. But the point is that we need to come before him. We need to come into his presence. We need to come before his face. Fullness, the word is soba. And it means satiety, abundance, fullness, satisfying, to be satisfied. To be satisfied in his presence. Didn't Jesus spend nights? Actually, let's take a look at that, what it says here in about Jesus in the book of um, in the book of Luke, chapter nine. Let's turn to Luke. We're talking about fullness in his presence. And there are some things that we, that we have in our, in our um, physiology that are, we, there are certain needs that need to be met. For example, we need to eat. We need to sleep. We need to drink water. We need fresh air. These are the laws of health, right? Um, but it's very interesting because We'll see a couple examples of, in the word of God, when you come into his presence, something very interesting happens. There's some kind of shift that happens supernaturally to where the things in the physical world kind of take a back seat to being in God's presence. It says that, let's see, Luke chapter 9 and 28 
through 36. Okay, just bookmark that. Hold your finger there. We're going to read that next. Um, when Jesus, I won't read this one, but I want to mention this before we read this. This is going to be the story of the transfiguration. When Jesus comes into the presence of God in front of three of the disciples, and something very interesting happens. But I also want to mention quickly, if you think back about when Jesus was first, uh, when he was baptized, and then he was led by the Spirit into the wilderness, it says that he didn't, he didn't eat for 40 days, right? Moses, when he was on the mount with God, he went 40 days without eating or drinking, without bread or water. Don't they say that you can't last a certain number of days without water? It says that Jesus went entire nights praying through the night without sleeping. Don't we need to sleep? Right? Um, there's many examples like that where the, the physical things that we think we need for our survival, when you're in the very, very presence of God, it's his presence takes precedence over even those physical necessities. Wasn't it said that uh, when they tested Sister White, when she was in vision and they put something in front of her, there was no breath. No breath? So <clears throat> what this shows me is that we have to make a transition in our minds because we're naturally geared towards, towards action. We're naturally geared towards accomplishment. We're naturally geared towards preparing, doing what we need to do. Let's do that, but let's have in our mind a stronger transition to, I'm going to give all my trust in the Lord. Because even if I don't have food and I don't have water, even if I'm not breathing, if it's his will, I can live. I can live and I can thrive, right? These are supernatural things that have really taken place. So let's look into this, um, this scripture here, and let's look at the story of the transfiguration. So can I have a reader? Who would like to volunteer read here? We have a microphone. Let's start in verse 28, and we'll go to, we'll stop at verse 36. 28, and we'll go to 36. I need a volunteer, please. Don't be shy. Okay, we have a volunteer right here. Oh, we got a microphone. We got one. Thank you, Brother Charles. Okay, Luke chapter 9, starting in verse 28. And it came to pass about in eight days after these things, he took Peter and John and James and went up into a mountain and prayed. And as he prayed, the fashion of his countenance was altered, and his remnant was wet and glistening. And behold, there talked with him two men, which were Moses and Elias, who appeared in glory and spake of his decease, which he should accomplish at Jerusalem. But Peter and they that were with him were heavy and sleep. And when they were awake, they saw his glory, and the two men that stood with him. Okay, then it happened as they were parting from him that Peter said to Jesus, Master, it's good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for you, one for Moses, one for Elijah, not knowing what he said. While he was saying this, a cloud came and overshadowed them, and they were fearful as they entered the cloud. And a voice came out of the cloud saying, This is my beloved son. Hear him. Hear him. And so even, in, you know, even the disciples who spent time with Jesus says that because they were sleepy, they missed the first part they missed the first part of the message that was being related to Jesus. See, they came to encourage him for the trial that he was going to go through. 
And it really was to confirm, if they were paying attention, it was going to confirm to them what, what Jesus would, was already telling them, that he was indeed going to die but rise again. But they missed that. So the part that they caught was they saw them together and they said, oh, oh, uh, you know, Lord, let's, let's make three tabernacles. And how often do we just speak, right, instead of uh, just humbling ourselves and, and being quiet? Lord, what is it that you would have me do, right? And so he tells them, he just, God just kind of cuts them off and says, look, this is my beloved son. Hear him. It's not about Moses. It's not about Elijah. It's about my beloved son. Hear him. Right? And so when they came down from the mountain, uh, now it happened on the next day, verse 37, when they had come down from the mountain, a great multitude met him. Suddenly a man from the multitude cried out, saying, Teacher, I implore you, look on my son, for he's my only child. And behold, a spirit seizes him, and he suddenly cries out. It convulses him, so he foams at the mouth, and it departs from him with great difficulty, bruising him. So I implored your disciples to cast it out, but they could not. Then Jesus answered and said, O oh, faithless and perverse generation, how long shall I be with you and bear with you? Bring your son here. And as he was coming, the demon threw him down and convulsed him. Then Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the child, and gave him back to his father. And uh, in, the, in another version, it says that, um, that Jesus answers and says, This kind does not come out but by prayer and fasting. So there are certain elements, there are certain things that we can do to come closer into the presence of God and to have the strength of God increased in our life tenfold, a hundredfold. And some of those things are by praying, by fasting. It's so essential, it's so powerful to fast, to pray, to study the scriptures, to become familiarized with his word. These are some ways that we come closer into his presence. And it might seem so simple, but do we, you know, there's people that are listening right now, right, on, uh, on, on the YouTube channel. And there's people that are out there that, you know, we were thinking about the end of all things. We're seeing the things that are happening in the news. But sometimes the answer is just so simple and just needs to be brought back and say, look, yes, all these things are happening, but you know the simple solution? Walk with God. Amen. You know the simple solution? Amen. Come into his presence. Because in his presence is the fullness of joy. Amen. And why would you have joy? Why would you have joy? Anyone? Why would you have joy? Because it's Jesus. Because you're with Jesus, right? Because you're with Jesus. Because He's filling you. Because He has the ability to take away your hunger. He has the ability to take away your fear. He has the ability to take away your sin. He has the ability to to give you everything that you could possibly need, right? In his presence is the fullness of joy, and it's joy now and forevermore. Because we can have joy in this world. Of course, it's going to be joy forever in heaven, but he can give you that joy right now. And he can give you confidence and grace and courage to face the trials that are coming. You see, the disciples, see, and I was looking for this quote the other day. I finally found it. In the Desire of Ages, it talks about the disciples, how... Um, let me just read it. Basically, they... Let's see. The disciples... This is page 216, the Zarev Ages. The disciples were not endowed with the courage and fortitude of the martyrs until such grace was needed. So the time they needed it is when they received it, right? We have the grace for right now, for today. For whatever trial you're going through, you come into God's presence... And you ask him for his blessings. It says, ask and you will receive, right? And the, the greatest thing he wants to give you is the gift of his spirit. Because in his presence is the fullness of everything, of joy. In his presence, he's going to give you everything you could possibly need. He's going to give you the courage. He's going to give you the fortitude. Whatever it is that you need to face the end times. The disciples were facing persecution, weren't they? The martyrs faced persecution, didn't they? We might face persecution, won't we? But it says that then the Savior's promise was fulfilled. When Peter and John testified before the Sanhedrin council, men marveled and they took knowledge of them that they had been with Jesus. They had been with Jesus. See, what would happen if you come up on your own strength? The demons will toss you around, right? And we have not even started to see the true full manifestation of wickedness yet. You know, it's going to be unleashed. And 
at the same time, a great outpouring of God's Spirit is going to be unleashed, such as like we've never seen before. The battle is, is going to be raging, and it's already raging right now. But which side do we want to be on? Which side, right? It says, Of Stephen it was written, All that sat in the council, looking steadfastly at him, saw his face as if it had been the face of an angel. Why had it been the fa like the face of an angel? Because he looked up into the heavens, right? And he saw Christ at the right hand of the Father, and he stood up. Christ was coming to his aid, to his rescue. Christ was coming to help him in his situation. It says, it said, let me see, um, I think that's in uh, Acts of the Apostles about Stephen. It says, it says, for him, the fear of death was gone. For him, the fear of death was gone. Do you know how horrible of, 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 uh, of, of murders were, were committed against the apostles? Um, the, the prophets sawn in half and, and boiled a lot and all kinds of things. But wouldn't that be amazing to where you can face it with boldness and courage? It says, for him, the fear of death was gone. It was gone. For him, the enraged priests and the excited mob had no terror. Had no terror. And then it says, the scene before him faded from his vision. To him, the gates of heaven were ajar. And looking in, he saw the glory of the courts of God and Christ as if just risen from his throne, standing ready to sustain his servant. Amen? Praise God. Isn't that powerful? That promise is for us too. That promise is for us too. It says, in words of triumph, Stephen exclaimed, Behold, I see the heavens opened and the Son of Man standing on the right hand of God. Very praise God. And, and who was there consenting to his death? Who was there consenting to his death? Saul, Saul who became Paul, one of the most powerful workers for God. But it says he was touched. He was touched by this, by the steadfastness of the martyr. That touched him. You know, he was, he was, you know, sometimes we hear it said that you don't know the effect of, uh, of what you do. We might not know until, until the kingdom of heaven. But not too long after, we saw one of God's strong men just uh, raise up. And it was greatly attributed to what he witnessed from Stephen. The boldness and the steadfastness and the courage that he had. And Stephen... He didn't, that wasn't the first time that he witnessed Christ, was it? Could it possibly be so? Could it possibly be that, that he never spent time with God? No, he was with God all the time, wasn't he? Um, there's, another, there's another passage that talks about, talks about us as his, as his um, witnesses. And basically it, it's saying here, that if we are going out on our own strength and we're not in him, it says the servants of Christ, this is page 215, um, Desire of Ages, the servants of Christ are not to act out the dictates of the natural heart. They're not to act out the dictates. Are you a servant of Christ? We're servants of Christ. We're not to act out the dictates of the natural heart. They need to have close communion with God lest under provocation self rise up. Unless under provocation self rises up. That's not a temptation for us, is it? For self to rise up if someone crosses you, you know, if someone doesn't treat you respectfully, if something happens in the home, if, you know, whatever the case is, we don't rise up and become aggressive, do we? Listen to what it says. It says, they need to have close communion with God, lest under provocation self rise up, and they pour forth a torrent of words that are unbefitting, that are not as the dew or the still showers that refresh the withering plants. 
This is what Satan wants them to do. For these are his methods. These are Satan's me methods to rebuttal with a torrent of words that are not fitting to water a withering plant. For these are his methods. It is the dragon that is wroth. And if we are like the dragon, then we, if we are, if we are allowing ourselves to also become wroth, are we being more like Jesus or more like the enemy? We're being like the dragon. It says, he is wroth. It is the spirit of Satan that is revealed in anger and accusing. Anger and accusing. But God's servants are to be representatives of him. He desires them to deal only in the currency of heaven. The current, what's the currency of heaven? Sorry? Love. What else? Kindness, joy, meekness, gentleness, long suffering, self control, the currency of heaven. He wants us to deal in the currency of heaven. The truth that bears his own image and superscription. The truth that bears his own image and superscription. The, the, the character we display is going to display whether or not it's his image that we have on us or the mark of the enemy. See, okay, we'll continue. The power by which they are to overcome evil is the power of Christ. The glory of Christ is their strength. The glory of Christ is their strength. They are to fix their eyes upon his loveliness. Then they can present the gospel with divine tact and gentleness. And the spirit that is kept gentle under provocation will speak more effectively in favor of the truth that will, that will, will speak more effectively in favor of the truth than will any argument, however forcible. That truth in our character that we display. It says, those who are brought in controversy with the enemies of truth have to meet not only men, but Satan and his agents. Let them remember the Savior's words. Behold, I send you forth as lambs among wolves. Let them rest in the love of God, and the Spirit will be kept calm, even under personal abuse. Even under personal abuse. How should we respond to personal abuse? Now, here's something interesting as we go back to the story here. And after the transfiguration, it says in the Desire of Ages something very interesting in regards to Satan, in regards to Christ, in regards to an image, the glory, and look at something that they saw. It says, while they were waiting at the foot of the mountain, a father brought to them his son to be delivered from a dumb spirit that tormented him. Authority over unclean spirits to cast them out had been conferred on the disciples when sent out to the twelve to preach through Galilee. As they went forth in strong faith, the evil spirits had obeyed their word. Now in the name of Christ, they commanded the torturing spirit to leave his victim. But the demon only mocked them by a fresh display of his power. The disciples, unable to account for the defeat, felt that they were bringing dishonor upon themselves and on their masters. So imagine the scene. Now you have a deflated uh, group of disciples. Now it, it says that when Jesus came down, he sensed that there was some kind of like chaos happening. And there was some, a sense of unease. It says, Jesus and the three disciples were seen approaching, and with a quick revulsion of feeling, the people turned to meet them. The night of communion with the heavenly glory had left its trace upon the Savior and his companions. What does that mean? What happened? How did it leave a trace of glory? What, what, changed, with the, what changed with them? Uh huh. And did some physical change manifest on their person? They were, they were clothed with glory. They had been seen in the presence of the Holy One. Mm -hmm. And so when they came back, now imagine the contrast. The disciples are up in the mountain. 
they see this holy scene. It's nighttime and it's so bright. It's like daytime from the glory that came and shone. And then they're in the presence of Jesus and Moses and Elijah. This is some holy thing. And the voice of God speaks. This is my beloved son in whom I'm well pleased. Hear him. And this glory, this just glory, it's just like, is this really happening? This is a heavenly scene happening. And then they come down the mountain. And what's happening on the bottom of the mountain? A demon has possessed this boy. And he's thrashing around, trying to kill him. There's chaos. And just think of the drastic difference, the complete darkness of the character of the enemy that has taken over a soul and the light of the glory of heaven. What God wants for his children on one side and the depths of what humanity has sunk into under the full control of Satan. It's complete darkness, complete sadness, complete degradation. And they see this great contrast In the brief space of time, the favored disciples have beheld the extreme of glory and of humiliation. They have seen humanity as transfigured into the image of God and as debased into the likeness of Satan. What a drastic difference. From the mountain where he has talked with the heavenly messengers and has proclaimed the Son of God by the voice from the radiant glory, they have seen Jesus descend to meet that most distressing and revolting spectacle, the maniac boy with distorted countenance, gnashing his teeth in spasms of agony that no human power could relieve. And this mighty Redeemer, who but a few hours before stood glorified before his wondering disciples, stoops to lift the victim of Satan from the earth where he is wallowing, and in health of mind and body restores him to his father and to his, and to his home. Praise God. Look at that in, in, uh, back in Luke chapter 9 and verse, and verse 42. And as he was coming, the demon threw him down and convulsed him. Then Jesus rebuked the unclean spirit, healed the child, and gave him back to his father. All were amazed at the majesty of God. All were amazed. This is what God wants to do for us. This is what God wants to do for the people out there. But what was the difference? What was the difference? The difference is, little by little, in this world, we continue to allow ourselves to be transfigured more like Satan by the things that we allow, by the things that are around us, by the things that we observe, by the things that we watch, by the things that we partake of. And why do we think that so many people are demon-possessed? There are a lot of demon-possessed people. There are a lot of people that are insane and out of their mind. They have lost their mind. And drugs are contributing to it. Well, what a degradation. You look at some of the big cities of this, of this country and you see pictures of people just hunched over. Is that what God wants for his children? But if we would come into his presence... And seek him with all his heart. He said, if you seek me, you will find me when you search for me with all your heart. Amen. And that's what we need. We need a revelation of Jesus. We need to see him as he is. We need to get to know him as he is. We need to spend time with him as he is. And this is what the people in the world need, brothers and sisters. They need to know Jesus. They need us to step aside. They need us to act like disciples, not get in their way, and point to Jesus. So they can see him, so they can spend time with him, so they can be lifted up out of that state. There's hope. Amen. There's hope for the worst sinner. There's hope for the worst drunkard. There's, worst, there's hope for people that have lost their mind. It says this boy was a lunatic. He lost his mind. Do you know that God can restore the mind? Yes, he can still restore your mind to you. Amen. Turn to Jesus with all your heart. Psalm 1611, in your presence is the fullness of joy. Psalms 24, 6. I'm going to save that one. Acts 17, 28, it says, They that seek the Lord, if happily they might feel after him and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. For in him we live 
and move and have our being. In him we live and move. And that's one of our pray what one of our prayers should be when we pray for these for our neighbors, for our brothers and sisters, for the people out there. That's what we should be praying for. That God would remove from their eyes the scales that is causing them to misjudge our loving Father. The Father that wants to save us. The Father that has so many good things for us. In his presence is the fullness of joy. We need to pray when we're going to outreach for the people that we, that we, that we meet, that God would remove this, um, 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 what's the word I'm looking for? This, um, <clears throat> that, he would, that he would remove this, this um, it starts with a D. What's the word I'm looking for? Um, discrimination. That he would remove the discrimination from God. People are discriminating against God all the time. People are openly mocking Jesus, and the media just makes a mockery of Jesus, our, our Savior. And he's the way. He's the way to freedom. He's the way to hope. It doesn't matter how far you've fallen, and that's what we need to let people know, too. It doesn't matter how far you've fallen. It doesn't matter how low you are. There is hope for the sinner. There is hope for the fallen. There is hope for the wicked if you turn if you only turn and live. In all your work, remember that you are bound up with Christ, a part of the great plan of redemption. The love of Christ in a healing, life-giving current is to flow through your life. As you seek to draw others within the circle of his love, let the purity of your language, the unselfishness of your service, the joyfulness of your demeanor bear witness to the power of his grace. Let it bear witness to the power of his grace. Do we still need his grace? We're sitting here in these pews today. Do we still need his grace? We need his grace. And we're, high, we're held to a higher standard, aren't we? It says that judgment will begin in the house of God. Lord have mercy. Right? With the elders. Jesus, help me. Pray for me. We, we need to keep this in mind to bear witness to the power of his grace by showing others that his grace is manifested in you, by showing others that his grace is real and it has changed you. Give to the world so pure and righteous a representation of him that men shall behold him in his beauty by looking at you, by looking at you. It's by our witness, it's by our testimony that many will be one to the kingdom. I'll read a couple, um, a couple other quotes here. It says, uh, of the, uh, in regards to the disciples, it says, their preparation was to be made day by day in treasuring up the precious truths of God's word and through prayer strengthening their faith. When they were brought into trial, the Holy Spirit would bring to their remembrance the very truths that were needed. A daily earnest striving to know God in Jesus Christ whom he had, whom he had sent would bring power and efficiency to the soul. It's going to bring power to our soul. That's Desire of Ages, page 216. Page 218. He who, he who would confess Christ must have Christ abiding in him. Must Is this a daily thing, brothers and sisters? Is it a daily thing to abide in him? We have to abide in him day by day by day after day. If you are confessing Christ, you have to abide in him. And if we think this doesn't apply to us, let me read this. Uh, by the way, in regards to persecution, this is an interesting passage, 218, Desire of Ages. It says, of all persecution, the hardest to bear is variancy in the home. Of all persecution, the hardest to bear is variancy in the home? Of all persecution? The hardest to bear is variancy in the home, the estrangement of dearest earthly friends? But Jesus declares, he that loveth father or mother more than me is not worthy of me. And he that loveth son or daughter more than me is not worthy of me. And he that taketh not his cross and followeth after me is not worthy of me. And he that allows his spouse 
to shake his faith or her faith or cause them to act in a way that's not befitting of a Christian is not worthy of him. So, he who would confess Christ must have Christ abiding in him. Must have Christ abiding in him. He cannot communicate that which he has not received. He cannot communicate that which he has not received. The disciples might speak fluently on doctrines, brothers and sisters. We might repeat the words of Christ himself, but unless we possess Christ-like meekness and love, they were not confessing him. They were not confessing him. A spirit contrary to the spirit of Christ would deny him. If you're displaying, if I am displaying a spirit that's contrary to the spirit of Christ, it is as good as denying him. It's not just about, it's not just about who's addicted to drugs and who's not. It's about, brothers and sisters, are you and I, day by day, displaying the fact that we are confessing him by possessing a Christ-like meekness and love, a Christ-like character? A spirit contrary to the spirit of Christ would deny him whatever the profession. Men may deny Christ by evil speaking, by foolish talking, by words that are untruthful or unkind. They may deny him by shunning life's burdens, by the pursuit of sinful pleasure. They may deny him by conforming to the world, by uncourteous behavior, by the love of their own opinions, by justifying self, by cherishing doubt, by borrowing trouble. We're denying Christ by borrowing trouble? Wow. We're denying Christ by cherishing doubt and dwelling in darkness. Dwelling in darkness. That's like if you get into a slump and you stay there. Get out of it. Get out of it. We don't have time to be down and discouraged and depressed. We have too much work to do. And we have a powerful living God who has given us everything, everything that we need in him. We have no reason, no reason to listen to the devil. Mm -hmm. And God wants his children to be powerful representatives of him now, right now. Because when the whole thing goes down, when the whole thing goes, it's too late to get ready. At the last, you gotta, we have to do it day by day by day. We have to be ready day by day by day, day by day. It says, in all these ways they declare that Christ is not in them, and whosoever shall deny me before men, he says, him will I also deny before my Father which is in heaven. But the good news is this. We're sinners saved by grace through faith in a powerful, loving Savior who loves us. He loves us. He loves us so much. He's there for us. Everything we need we can tap on the, on the pot and he'll provide flour. Yeah. Everything we need. Uncle Nestor always says, just trust in the Lord. Ever since I came here, that was the first thing and the, the, the continuing message, just trust in the Lord. Just trust in the Lord, brothers and sisters. Just trust in the Lord. Let's focus on the kingdom of heaven. Seek first the kingdom of heaven. And all these things will be added unto you. Seek first the kingdom of heaven and his righteousness. It says... In the time of trouble, brothers and sisters, we're going to need to have him as our hiding place. But let's not wait to make him our hiding place till the time of trouble comes. Let's find that place under his wings now, today, tomorrow, and every day. And if that's your desire, brothers and sisters, to experience the fullness of joy in his presence, then let's stand together. Let's stand together and let's say, yes, Lord. I want to be in the fullness of your presence. I want to experience the joy day by day by day by day, just like the disciples, just like the apostles, just like Moses when he saw your face and he came shining, just like the prophet Isaiah who caught a vision of you and you gave him a message 
just like the prophet Ezekiel who saw a vision of you and you gave him a message. Is that what you want? For the Lord to speak to us, for the Lord to guide us, for the Lord to encourage us, for the Lord to use us, for the Lord to strengthen us. Day by day by day in his presence is the fullness of joy, brothers and sisters. Let's pray. Gracious Father, we thank you, Lord. We thank you because you give us multiple examples, Lord, of how you provide every last one of our needs. You tell us, Lord, that even the things that we think we need, just being in your presence is even greater. And Father, we desire to be your faithful servants. We desire, Lord, to witness the same power in our lives that you have displayed through Stephen, that you have displayed, Lord, through Peter and Paul, that you've displayed through your son, Jesus. And we thank you that Jesus has come and he's overcome sin so that we could follow in his footsteps by his grace, through his power. And Lord, that you didn't leave us. Lord, you give us the greatest gift of all, your spirit. And through the gift of your Holy Spirit, Lord, Lord, we can do all things. We can overcome Satan. We can overcome our own sinful tendencies, Lord, by your grace and by your power. So please, Lord, give us a strong desire to seek after your face with all of our might and all of our heart, day by day by day, Lord, so we can be ready and we can be full of joy. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. For the benediction, I want to share a couple promises. First of all, it's very interesting that when you leave your home and you're far away in a different place, it's just interesting that when you talk to somebody who's back from your hometown, I'm from Wisconsin, and all of a sudden, I might start talking like that, you know. <laughs> and if you're from, I have a friend from New York who spent time in Oklahoma, and he kind of talks like this now. But it's interesting that whoever you're around, you start to become like them, right? You start to unconsciously just start to grab onto something. True reformation begins with soul cleansing. Our work for the fallen race will achieve real success only as the grace of Christ reshapes the character and the soul is brought into living connection with God. We're going to be changed and transformed as we are brought into living connection with God. We're going to become more like Him as we are brought into a living connection with Him. The more time we spend with Him, the more we're going to be like Him. Nothing is apparently more helpless, yet really more invincible than the soul that feels its nothingness and relies wholly on the merits of the Savior by prayer, by the study of His Word, by faith in His abiding presence. The weakest of human beings may live in contact with the living Christ, and He will hold them by a hand that will never let them go. Amen. May God bless you. Happy Sabbath.